Well, good evening, everyone. Mayor Drew Dilkins here. Welcome to Poetry at the Manor. Now, this is the ninth installment of this annual event, and of course, it's virtual once again this year as we continue to fight back against the COVID-19 virus. Now, throughout the pandemic, Windsor's Poets Laureate have shared their words with us. They have captured the feelings and the experiences of our community, bringing hope and inspiration. And this year, we mark the 10th anniversary of our Poet Laureate program. Now, how fitting to be able to welcome the laureates for Canada, Ottawa, Ontario, and Barrie to join our own team for this year's reading. We're honored to welcome Louise Bernice Half, Albert Dumont, Randall Adjay, and Victoria Butler. And on behalf of Windsor's laureates, Marty, Marianne, and Alexi, who you are joining us tonight, welcome to the city of Windsor. We're glad you're with us, and we're proud to share poetry at the Manor online again this year. Thank you for participating in this unique event, and thank you for sharing your words, your voices, and your diverse perspectives with our community. Welcome to the ninth edition of Poetry at the Manor. It's certainly one of the most popular poetry events in Ontario, and it's an event that brings together Poets Laureate from across the country to our little corner of Canada. And by the way, in an old Ripley's Believe It or Not card, it claims this is the only spot in Canada where the United States is actually north of us. So when the rest of the country <laughs> talks about, yeah, it's true, when the rest of the country talks about our neighbors to the south, we put up our hands and say, do you mean us? True enough. Um, I'm Marty Gervais, I'm the city's uh, Poet Laureate Emeritus and both Marianne Mulhern, Windsor's current Poet Laureate and I are pleased to welcome and introduce the evening. And with us tonight, we are so pleased to have Louise Bernice Half, Sky Dancer, Canada's first Indigenous Parliamentary Poet Laureate, Randell Leger, Ontario's inaugural Poet Laureate, Albert Dumont, the newest Poet Laureate from Ottawa, Victoria Butler, a rising star in the poetry world, and now Poet Laureate from Barrie, Ontario, and Windsor's own Youth Poet Laureate, Alexi Unagarshu. And uh, so let's begin the, this reading tonight, but I wanna make sure that I thank my good friend and collaborator in opera and theater, Nadine Deluri, you know, for the beautiful cello performance on site outside the Willisted Manor to start off our program. For my out of town guests, when this reading series refers to the manor, I just wanna let you know, we're talking about Willisted Manor. It's a gem in Windsor that sits in the heart of Old Walkerville the town that the Whiskey Baron Hiram Walker built. This manor was designed by the renowned architect Albert Kahn. It was done in an old sort of 16th century, English century manor house. And it was built around 1904 to 1906 by Hiram Walker's son, Edward Chandler Walker. And he and his wife, Mary, at one time had the most incredible collection of art in that house that included the likes of Monet and Renoir. My own particular connection to this house, by the way, was when I first arrived here in 1968, and the lower part of Willisted was the public library, and the upstairs was the art gallery. And it was there that I met the legendary artist Harold Town, who, upon reading a poem of mine, offered to trade a signed printer proof of a poster for the copy of that poem. So poetry has been my connection to this building for more than 50 years. And when the Poet Laureate program itself started, and that was 10 years ago, my promise as the inaugural Poet Laureate for Windsor was to invite Poets Laureate from across the country to Windsor and for them to hear something of our story and also to listen closely to the stories of other Canadian communities. And what better place than Willis Dead Manor? So over the nine years, Poetry of the Manor has drawn 36 Poets Laureate to read their work in our corner of Ontario here on the South Shore. And I have to tell you, it was a huge success right from the very beginning. In normal conditions, uh, and it seems like COVID is becoming normal, but, but in normal conditions, year after year, it's been standing room crowds, standing room only crowds with audiences spilling out on the staircases, onto balconies and sitting on the floor. Victoria, Butler, who was here at one of those readings, may remember just how crowded things were. But what a wonderful feeling for a poet to have that kind of audience. The audience is so close, literally, you couldn't outstretch your arms and you'd be already touching the audience. That's how close they were. 
And Victoria may have been there the night when Windsor's mayor, Drew Dilkins, decided to pop in to see just what all the fuss was about the poet laureate reading and curiously found himself barely able to get in the door and was probably thinking maybe he should alert the fire chief because we had far outstripped the, you know, the bylaw capacity requirements. Fortunately, someone recognized the mayor and squeezed him into the building and he forever became a fan of this annual event and the Poet Laureate program itself. And so has the city. I mean, its biggest supporter from day one was Councillor Joanne Geniak, who recognized that this Poet Laureate program was a game changer for culture in Windsor. And I must also thank Christopher Lawrence Menard from Cultural Affairs with whom I dreamed big and brought poetry to be read on the riverfront, in retirement homes, at city hall, in libraries, and even when the tall ships docked in our ports. So tonight, though we aren't at the Manor House in Williston Manor, we are there in spirit. And this is a virtual reading as it was last year. And we made that commitment last year to keep this event running without interruption, if not in the actual old Walkerville Manor, then at least online. But believe me, when all is said and done, as always, we will count each one of these poets who hail from communities far and wide as part of our community. And I would like to begin tonight with introducing Marianne Mulhern. Marianne has a remarkable story, having been raised in a house in a cemetery. You heard me right. <laughs> Her father was a grave digger, and after she left school, she went off to teacher's college, then off to become a school teacher, and then she made a complete about turn, a detour, and she joined a convent. Yeah, you heard me right. She spent eight years there re before returning to secular life. Her book, The Red Dress, her first of eight books, is about her life in that convent. And this book was an instant success and to date stands as one of the best selling books of poetry in Canada. It was featured on in the Toronto Star and brought her to the attention of CBC's highly popular network tapestry. Marianne is Windsor's poet laureate. She's a good friend. Welcome, Marianne. Thanks, Marty. I want to read Ghost Light from our wonderful book, Dance of Self-Isolation, the poems we wrote during COVID, Ghost Light. In every Broadway theater, a ghost light shines after music, song, and dance fade into midnight hours and curtains close over silence. In the darkness of COVID, Maybe the moon is our ghost light as she keeps vigil from her pale circle until sunlight brightens our horizon and we dance into the dawn. I'm just gonna, can I just interrupt you, Marianne? I just wanna ask you a, a question if I could about the, the poem. Uh, I'm curious, you know, one of the things that the two of us have been doing during COVID in its toughest days was to write poetry and to find a positive note in all the isolation, all the statistics. And I noticed from the many emails from you um, that you have been taking snapshots of the, of the sun at dawn over the river and, and the lake and where you live. And I don't think this fascination with the sun is like a tourist absentmindedly snapping a picture of an historic building though. So tell me you know, its significance for you. Oh, there's remarkable significance. The ancients worshiped the sun and the sun gives us life. Without the sun, we wouldn't have life on this planet. We have crops, we have light, we have warmth. And of course we have ongoing life on this beautiful planet because of the sun. And I can understand why the ancients worshiped the sun. When I see that beauty in the morning and I send you those photographs, I'm just in awe of it every single time it happens. So this is just is something just so beautiful and so wonderful and something for all of us to be thankful for. And I am. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for that. And, uh, and you have some new poems that you're going to read tonight as well, I think, from your new book. Yes, yes. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from 
The Midnight Moon Sings of Murder, which is a book primarily about this tragic Donnelly family of Lucan, Ontario, all of whom, not all of whom, but five of whom were murdered in their beds the night of February 4, 1880. William Donnelly said, if a stone dropped from heaven, it would be blamed on the Donnellys. As an Irish writer, I guess I'm somewhat superstitious. And I visited Lucan, places where the Donnellys lived and the place where they died. I think that that leaves some sort of an effect and that manifests itself. When I returned to Windsor, I went to an old fashioned coffee shop and there was an event there about which I wrote. I call it ghost in a coffee shop. A woman, tall, sturdy, plain, woolen skirt, winter boots, stares at me, a poet. I've stood over the grave of Johanna Donnelly. Something in this woman's eyes speaks to me of another place, another time. I look away. Silence spins around me, shadowed presence close, cold and sad and dark. I had never seen that woman before and I have never seen her again. And yet I think of her often. And I'm going to read one more poem from that collection. I went to the actual site of the Donnelly murders. I went to the site of the log cabin that Johanna and James Donnelly built in the 1800s. And that was on the same property as Cedar Swamp Schoolhouse in which angry, jealous neighbors met February 4, 1880, got drunk, got weapons, chose weapons, went into the Donnelly farmhouse and murdered five people. I noticed when I went into the home of Rob and Linda Saltz, who now own the property, a clock. And I asked them about that clock because it absolutely fascinated me. And this is the poem. Clock. A clock from Cedar Swamp Schoolhouse tells perfect time as it did the night of February 4, 1880 when a member of the Vigilance Committee took minutes for their meeting, plans to kill every Donnelly in the log cabin just outside the window. The clock is a witness. Listen to the rhythm, the sound, how it speaks. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Very odd. Just a very quick question. Uh, you know, how is your, you know, uh, how is your childhood living in a cemetery house shaped you and your poetry? Oh, I think that's contributed a lot to my poetry because I, as a child, witnessed things that other people just don't have an opportunity to do. For example, I would often um, see people come to the house, to the cemetery house, to speak to my father. And some of these people were grieving terribly about their loved one. And some of them were guilty about their loved one. As a child, I took all of that in. Also in the cemetery itself, I witnessed my father actually digging graves. And I would sometimes be there when the funeral arrived. I always left, of course, because that was the only right thing to do. But as a child, death for me was a very normal thing. 
And when the kid, the other kids at school said, what does your dad do? I said, well, he's, he digs graves and he takes care of the cemetery. And they said, you're lying. They all said that you're lying. <laughs> so um, I guess nobody had ever talked to them about death or dying. And wow. so it's, it's, it's quite a bit. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't think I believed you when you told me that you lived in a cemetery as well. So, um, but what a powerful image that's brought to your poetry. Our next reader is Louise Bernice Half, Sky Dancer. And she's been to Windsor before uh, a, a few times. And she is uh, serving as Canada's Parliamentary Poet Laureate. She was raised on Saddle Lake Reserve, attended Blue uh, Quill's Residential School. She's a graduate of social work from the university and has served on various committees throughout Canada and provides services uh, with OPIC and Elder Circle that works with apprehended children and their families. In 2005, Louise served as Saskatchewan's second poet laureate. She is widely recognized for weaving Cree language and teachings into her works. Her books, uh, Bare Bones and Feathers in 1994, Blue Marrow in, in 2004, the Crooked Good in 2007 and Burning in This Midnight Dream 2016 have all received numerous accolades and awards. And her latest work, Awasis, Kinky and Disheveled, was released this spring. So I'm so pleased to welcome Louise Bernice Half, Sky Dancer. Thank you so much for taking part in this, Louise. <laughs> Uh, greetings to everyone, especially all the poets and uh, to the audience who are listening and thank you for this invitation. I'm gonna read uh, one, uh, one poem um, or two from Burning in This Midnight Dream. And I will read it because of the recent Orange Shirt Day, which isn't a celebration for me and for many survivors from residential school. So I'll start with a poem called The Reserve Went Silent. The playground went silent. A lone robin hopped in an expanse of the yard where once children scraped their elbows and knees, drew lines in the dirt for hopscotch or designated the imaginary rooms of a house and lined the cupboards with mud pies. The yard now empty where once a lively baseball field of excited runners were out, wore out trails between first base and third, where once the home base was a tattered mount of scraped up dirt and straggly grass. I see this now. I never saw the searing pain on my mother's face, nor experienced my father's eyes squeezed to damn his blood. The world went mute when the Pied Piper played his organ through the reservation. My parents never spoke of that gash that tore through the families and gutted the whole reserve. Which means good child rearing. It took me a while to get used to his name. It was as if I was talking to my late brother, the one who stepped out on the highway into the winter night of a roaring truck, my middle brother, my childhood rock. Years ago, I visited the graveyard on a reserve and counted all the dead from residential school, relatives, friends, from my brother's life, there were over 30 of his peers, suicide, murder, trauma, fire, under the safe blanket of the res. So many years and I'm still weeping. This one is uh, from Oasis, the recent one that was uh, released, Kinky and Disheveled. Awasis is often thought of as the ch little child. And this is a, a, um, a shapeshifter with no gender because we don't have pronouns in Korean English. 
uh, pardon me, in Cree. We don't have any pronouns to define gender. And Owasis in this particular book is the adult child within. And um, its literal meaning, Owasis, means the spirit that we've been loaned. This is called dress up. Owasis often laughed at how a woman wiggled her hips to adjust her muffin top as they were talking. Owasis girlfriends often wore spandex and girdles to look like Victoria's Secret. She wasn't too far behind in sucking in belly fat to hold Windy Boy captive. She was peeved that pot bellied men could float over their pants while she grunted and sweated on the treadmills. Travel bug. Oasis, Gilgil, other countries. She visited other countries. She knew no borders. Sometimes she traveled with Spoon Hunter, a robust, slick, and charming evening dancer who lifted his feet in a graceful round dance or at a summer powwow. He was a good companion. They visited the country where the stones held hands. Driving the hills, they came across waterfall. To get a closer view, they had to go through a turnstile. Too cheap to spend their money, they squeezed through together to walk the rocky hillside path only they got stuck. They sucked in their bellies, attempted to free their legs, thighs kissed one another. The more they struggled, the more tears and snot erupted. No one was near to hear their bellies make good thunder. They thought they'd be found, two skeletons stuck together, skulls laughing. Hi, hi, can ask them now, hi, hi. Wow, such um, powerful, evocative language, um, lovely imagery. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, I have a question for you and that it's, uh, I'm wondering, you know, with your role as a parliamentary poet laureate and have you found a role for poetry with this ever increasing attention being placed on indigenous issues in Canada? Actually, there is. There's all kinds of people awakening in the writers community in, in Indigenous Canada. Novels are coming out, the sharing of uh, autobiographies, a lot of po uh, contemporary uh, poets that are younger than me, which I really appreciate, are stepping up. Um, they may not have the same world experience that I have with residential school. However, they're the they're, they're uh, the generations after, and some of them come from intergenerational trauma. And um, they have their own way of presenting, which I really appreciate. They can do things that um, I'm not able to do in um, a more sophistic sophisticated manner, and that's okay. Everybody needs to uh, share the history and share their voice and listen to one another in dialogue. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I, I'm wondering, uh, I read somewhere that you didn't start writing till you were 16 and that you didn't even, you weren't even aware of, of poetry. Uh, but in fact, you were writing poetry when you look back at it. Can you share a little bit about that experience? It was a long journey. Um, uh, at the age of 16, I was fresh out of residential school. And I, need, I didn't know who I was, where I was going, what my future held, and I had no home to call my own because my, my parents were dispersed. Our, our family had been fragmented, fragmented by a residential school. And so I was out to find myself, but it was also not a happy situation. Both my parents were residential school survivors. And so there was a lot of uh, family dysfunction. And um, so I left home at an early age and I was trying to write, uh, write my way out of my own depression and suicidal tendencies because um, I was 
so messed. And, and then when my children were growing up, um, haven't gone into therapy, I started to listen to CBC Radio, Peter Zosky, and um, listening to some of the uh, writers that he was talking to, reading some of the books that he was suggesting, suggesting. And I had been writing, just keeping a journal, essentially and not realizing that in this process of journal writing, I was discovering my voice and writing poetry. And I was encouraged by several people, um, Professor Ron Markham, who is a good friend and mentor, who, who turned me on to Patrick Lane. And um, the two writers, editors from R Women uh, Writing the Circle, um, I, I can't remember, Sylvia Bance and uh, Jean Perrault, I think were the, uh, uh, took me aside and also said to me, you know, you have the voice for poetry, why don't you consider um, uh, pursuing it? But before all this occurred, I had had dreams early on about the journey toward writing. And um, my grandfather came to me in a dream and showed me syllabics, which I had never read in my life, but I would watch him as a child, his fingers across the page reading syllabics. I never learned to read it myself, but in the dream, he was showing me that I needed to write. And there was um, subsequent dreams after that. And then I went to back to my home reserve into ceremony. Um, and uh, my elders affirmed without them knowing that I was writing, mm -hmm. uh, that I was to be a writer and that my journey would take me a long place. So I've watched it evolve. And it's been a real blessing and a real um, a rewarding experience because me from the res, little poor girl, never knew I'd be traveling this world or talking as much as I am. So thank you for asking. Appreciate that. No, I just find it fascinating. And I, I hope those journals are still around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank well, thank you so much uh, for being thank here you. and sharing that. Our next reader is uh, Randall Leger, and uh, he's an author, an inspirational speaker, arts educator, community leader, he uses spoken word as his choice of genre, of his choice of medium to empower and transform, and now he's Ontario's first poet laureate. His life has not been an easy one. His childhood was surrounded by violence. At times he was part of it, at times he was the victim. And the, but the story that really stands out for me and rivets my attention is one from when he was in high school, when he was brutally attacked by seven people. He was stabbed in the elbow, stabbed in the back. Uh, he was robbed of all his material possessions. And in light of this event, as well as in response to his own childhood arrests, I think from the age of 12, real, uh, Randell realized he wasn't the, the only one going through all these troubles. And, and that's what led him to creating RISE, which stands for Reaching Intelligent Souls Everywhere. It's a safe and inclusive space for youth to express themselves in positive ways using music, poetry, dance, all sorts of creative outlets. And as RISE grew, so did Rondell's popularity. And he was awarded multiple uh, awards and you know received so many accolades. and. And he's performed in, with high profile individuals such as Barack Obama and Terry Crews. And he published his first anthology, I Am Not My Struggles in 2018. And it's my pleasure to welcome you, Randell. Thanks for, for being part of this in, in Windsor. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here. Um, and just, it's, it's awesome. You know, when else do we get an opportunity to have poet laureates from across this amazing province uh, and country come together? So. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Today's set, I want it to be something that could inspire, could remind us all of purpose, pushing past adversity. Um, I'm gonna be reading from my book called I Am Not My Struggles, published in 2018. And uh, I wanted to write this book to be a reminder and affirmation that what we go through in life does not necessarily have to define us, that it's just a part of what we experience as individuals and that we have an opportunity to learn from these lessons, to learn from these hardships. I mean, how do you appreciate the positive things in life if you don't know what negative is, right? So uh, the first poem I want, to, I want to share with you, I have three. Uh, the first one I wanna share with you all today is I'm an artist. 
And uh, I just believe in the power of affirmations and this is how I embody my, my time here on earth. <laughs> I am an artist and I don't have any time to be silent no time to allow these words to asphyxiate my ancestry amidst this violence, amidst this despair. I can't deny the world my gift because of fear. Living a life of purpose and service cannot and will not die with my gift still in here. Inspired by my pain and how close death came. Images of a tombstone inscribed with my name. Just then I snapped back to a new era a new lane, and then my real eye realized that I could be the one to make a change. See, I am an artist, creator of lyrical calligraphy, take you on a journey with my soliloquies, literary imageries full of healing, may my words add meaning to your life and the thoughts you left behind with the things that I write, may my words penetrate your soul, levitate your being beyond the thoughts that you think you know. Because see, ignoring the call of our dreams can be lethal. If you ignore the call of your dreams, it can be lethal, especially when we tell our big dreams to small-minded people. Because see, pumping in the depths of me is my heartistry, this life-giving gift that I was given. How can I deny the world my gift because of the creator's imprint? How dare I suppress the talents etched in the flesh of my chest? Am I not grateful? Do I not cherish it? Randell, have you not realized that this is a ticket to your exodus? See, when chasing our dreams, sometimes we ask, is it worth it? But have you not realized that by not doing it, you are causing the world a disservice, a failure to fulfill your purpose? Because see, I am an artist, persistently pushing pens and pencils, living in my purpose, practicing my pure potential. See, we artists, we have to get creating when the world is devastated. We are the beacons of hope, healing to suicide notes. We change people's lives with this gift. So no matter how rough it gets, don't quit. Know that you can push beyond the limits. You are an image of the infinite. Every choice that we make fulfills our life's pages. See, the road ahead is gonna be tough, but remain patient. Know that you're designing magic in the making. So when the blueprint of your story is read, will it free others from the matrix? Thank you, that was my first poem. Thank you all so much, really appreciate it. Uh, this next poem that I have to share, I think I'm just gonna merge them into one. Uh, actually, no, I won't, because they, 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 they live really well together, but they kind of coincide in a way. Um, so you mentioned a little earlier, Marty, uh, about my encounter. You know, I've, uh, death has uh, kissed me twice. And I think it just reminded me um, a couple of things. One, it's not about the day we are born nor the day we leave, but really about that dash in between and what we're able to do with our time here on earth um, and just maximize our time here. So this is the dash. I often question if a coffin is where my legacy is destined. A rigor mortis reflection of me buried six feet deep in the six, my legacy, my soul awaiting the arrival of 12 disciples and no remnants of me. No fruits of labor left for my seeds, not leaving this world better than when I came in. My name, forgotten. Not even whispered upon the lips of those my actions impacted. It's scary. I heard once that the worst thing that can happen to us when we are no longer here is not death itself. It is to be forgotten. And I just cringe at the thought of my efforts lost in coffins, boxed in the same confines that caused me problems, my life, my beliefs, encrypted in tombstone, indicating the dates to and from. But I hope the dash in between represents more than just the good work I've done. My life blowing in the wind like the breath that has left my lungs only to leave this world unfulfilled with holes in the potential that I was given. And re-spinning the same cycle to my children. See, when your time comes, and your soul is sent. What will the dash on your tombstone represent? Thank you, appreciate it. That was my second poem. And uh, for my final piece that I wanna share, it's called The Power of the Tongue. And I think some of us as writers, as speakers are just born into it and uh, just kind of go back. We just have to find a way to, to embody who we are as individuals and step into our, our purpose. And this is the power of the tongue. 
Since the day I learned my first word, self-expression has always been second nature. I am a child prodigy of third world parents, so I have to tell my forefathers stories on paper. Silence for too long, the strength of my tongue sentenced me to a life of righting wrongs. My penmanship bridges the gaps of intergenerational dialogues. Marginalized between the lines of lands my parents traveled, sacrificing the familiarity of home to make ease for me, life's inevitable battles. So who am I to not be what I was destined? Who are you to not be what you were destined? I mean, despite, despite school systems that labeled me and sanctioned me to detention, Despite the target on my back and private funding to put my melanin in prison correction, I will not be your stereotype. I am made from the essence of stardust above aerial heights. It is not my fault you cannot see the light in me. You cannot enlighten me on your capitalist commodities. I'm the rose that's still adapted to blossom out of colonized concrete. Capitalizing on conquered conquests my predecessors paid, placing poetic politic on history's page. It is these pages cut from my family trees that once hung our forefathers as slaves. It is these pages I tell their stories. It is these lines that once hung from I celebrate their glory just to stay connected to my roots. See, these pages are sacred. It's how hip hop's essence began as pure truth. But see, these days, I can't relate to what a lot of rappers are saying in the booth. Because see, the spoken word, the spoken word is a gift. And you can emanate life or death by the mere intention coming out of your lips. We can speak dreams into existence, creating a world united or divided. So you can choose to be the change or remain silent. By size, the tongue is the strongest muscle in our bodies for a reason, by size. The tongue is the strongest muscle in our bodies for a reason. It is a tool to connect us to the divine. More than just speaking, it keeps us believing. It is a portal between time and space mix, the inspiration of ancient hieroglyphs. See, our words can build dynasties and mend broken bonds. Our words can create vitality and give us the freedom of redemption songs. Our words can live beyond us like MLK's dream to see us free at last, so be mindful. Be mindful of the words and the intentions that leave the sacredness of your tongue. We are powerful vessels the creator etched presence into our lungs so you have a gift within you. Leave a legacy that will continue. Etch your name in the dendrochronology of history's pages. Do not allow the from and to on your tombstone just to be dated. Let the dash in between reveal the story you told and of the magic that you created. Thank you so much. I'm uh, really grateful to be here. Although we're not in person at the manor, I hope you all uh, enjoyed the performance so far and and what's to come well that was a, an amazing performance and you know um you say that uh, we are all um powerful vessels and we are poets are powerful vessels and the other thing you say in that last piece is that uh that we should stay connected to our roots and i think that applies to everyone i think it applies uh, you know that we should pay attention to our roots and Randell, uh, you know, I know that in the, some of the discussions we've had um, about telling our story and hearing our story from all across Ontario and, and for, uh, I'm a, you know, one of your ideas and one of the ideas that's come out of that discussion was that somehow to collect all of those stories. But I want to ask you, you know, we're going through tough times. We're still going through tough times and we are um, with this pandemic and, and you've started being Ontario's first poet laureate right in the midst of all of this. And I'm wondering if the times have somehow altered your mandate as poetry's representative or changed in any way what you wanted to accomplish. Absolutely. I mean, one of the major things for the the man or for the appointment is really about traveling across Ontario. And of course, that hasn't happened in the in the five months that I've been the poet laureate of Ontario. But at the same time, I think there's something beautiful about that because I've had the opportunity to connect with poet laureates from across the province without leaving my home. So there's something quite beautiful about that <laughs> as well, too. And I think we can do more. Um, but also there's something to be said about um, the seeds of opportunity in, in an adversity of like a pandemic. So I'm just trying to see what I can learn and grow from as a result. And, uh, and in terms of spoken word, I mean, do you, uh, um, you know, what's, you know, what's the landscape like 
you know, for you in spoken word. I mean, I mean, as you say, you know, we're living through a pandemic and you are, you know, in your apartment or your home. And uh, so you're not on a stage. So it must have, it is, it's had to somehow affect you in that, re in that regard. Although your performance tonight was amazing. Thank you. Um, I love being on stage. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do, that opportunity to really share space with audience and have an opportunity to have a dialogue. I think poetry really allows us to have a dialogue that normal conversation doesn't allow us to have. And on stage is something really quite beautiful and powerful about that. But at the same time, uh, I'm just I'm just really grateful. You know, this opportunity has been amazing and, and I look forward to working with uh, the other poet laureates in the future. So just, you know, you take what you get, and you maximize and make the most of it. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. And, and I'm hoping at some point in time, when things, uh, when the restrictions lift, we'll get you here uh, in Windsor and on a stage in front of hundreds of people. So my promise, all of you. Amazing. I, I will be there. <laughs> and thank you so much, Marty. Oh, thank you. Uh, our next uh, uh, laureate is Alexi Ungare Nashu, and he is a uh, the youth poet laureate. Um, and you know, he didn't expect to move to Canada, much less become Windsor's youth poet laureate. He was born in Romania. His family emigrated to uh, Toronto when he was twelve. He came to Windsor when he was eighteen, and he's now attending the University of Windsor. Uh, he's actually in a class uh, of mine at the University of Windsor, a class in editing and publishing. And he says he brought an outsider turned insider perspective with him when he came to Windsor. Alexi was at Poetry of the Manor in 2015, and he says he recalls watching poets laureate and distinctly noticing the Canadian flourish their poems possessed. And this, he believes, has influenced his own way of approaching his writing. Alexia only recently has become you know, Windsor's Youth Poet Laureate and has already is already creating a bit of a splash uh, in the community. And uh, he was at a reading very recently, uh, outdoor reading. And, uh, and I see that he's reaching the youth and uh, his poems embrace his Canadian identity while drawing upon his Romanian roots. Please welcome Alexi. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, just a correction. Uh, I was at the uh, Manor uh, reading in 2019. Um, oh. I was still in Toronto in 2015, and I had no idea I would be moving to Windsor. So it's been uh, quite a journey, and I'm so happy it brought well, me here. Uh, well, that's why I didn't see you in 2015. Don't remember you. <laughs> and in 2019, I was like far back on the stairs. Uh, it was so packed, uh, as you were saying. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I will just go ahead and uh, start with my first poem. Uh, this one is called Details. A book in Chicago, sunflowers on the table, the same book on a beach in Santa Monica, the first goodbye. Sunburn on my back at a bar in Denver, Grant says it will peel by the grace of God. My first time trying biscuits and gravy. Crossing borders disguised as a writer, a genealogy test from my cousin tells me who I'm supposed to be, not that it matters. Postcard from Seattle, guiding the blind clerk's hand toward the card. He asks and I tell him it's a picture of fireworks. Fourth of July show with strangers. Three weeks later, my mom holds my hand in La Ronde. We watch the sky explode in a fury of marvel and colors. Linden and my arms on the Canadian, the secret of lights playing at nighttime next to the train, the mountains surround us alone in the restaurant car. Handwritten notes on the train to LA, Brooke says she's a snake in the Chinese zodiac. Forests turn to deserts, turn to ocean, turn to me. Walking too close by the shore at the end of low tide, a wave brushes my leg, now I carry the Pacific across state lines. Between the beach and the forest, a tent, the ground shakes with every crashing wave rocking me to sleep. Bug bites on my arms, itch next to a new tattoo, 
the results of catching a travel bug in Ferndale. A book in Chicago, sunflower seeds under my skin, shedding memories like pages from forgotten novels. Thank you, that was the first one, uh, details. And it's one of a few uh, train poems I have. There's uh, something about train journeys and the people you meet on the train van uh, really inspires me. Uh, I think trains make things happen. And the next one uh, is a short one, so I, I will read it twice. Uh, it's called Ochre. You engulf me, sudden sunset, purple puffs, ochre glow, keeping hope apart from patience, keeping Nero from his roam. And again, ochre. You engulf me, sudden sunset, purple puffs, ochre glow, keeping hope apart from patience, keeping Nero from his roam. Right? And lastly, I will read uh, Fuchsia, which is a bit of an uh, environmental poem. And uh, it was inspired by this article I read that compared uh, people's reactions to uh, climate change uh, with um, the theory of the five stages of grief. So this is a uh, fuchsia. Heralds of September, another anniversary around the corner. Birds that survive us pluck at dust on the ground, faced with the first stage, denial. No crumbs to explain this error in existence the lack of reason for sudden disappearance. A crowd spills from an elevator, ghosts in suits, cigarettes float on rooftops offering relief from the second stage, anger. If ectoplasm could turn red, burn with futile resistance against a dying earth, one poison imitates other poisons. Fruit flies on the ceiling shake hands riddled with anxiety. They check tiny watches and itineraries to confirm a shared history. Prepared for the third stage, bargaining. When all bets are off, labor goes unpaid. No rendezvous survives without relocation amid confusion. Ants come out once in a while, dodging beaks to send smoke signals to other anthills. From holy mountains to busy skyscrapers, the sacred becomes profane once more, envelops itself in the fourth stage, depression. The nothing I can do and I'm too small, when ants carry dozens of times their own weight, we fall short and succumb to the pressure. On a tree not too far away from here, fuchsia flowers resign to the tempest. Bells arrange to play funeral songs, Decide to play one more hymn instead. A wedding dance for the last stage. Acceptance. The initiation into the unknown. A marriage short-lived but lived nonetheless in structures, habits, plans, deals, economies of deterioration. The fruits of our labor will not go unnoticed by the fires and the winds. Thank you. Well done, well done, Alexi. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question, much the same question in some ways that I asked Rondell. And you know, here we are doing living through a pandemic, and I'm wondering, you know, as as when's your second youth poet laureate? I'm wondering how you might involve your peers through poetry during this time. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I also started, like I said, at the same time almost as Rondell. Um, and I knew going into it that uh, it would take a while uh, until we could return to in-person events. Uh, one of the ways I've started um, engaging my peers is uh, by doing a series of online Zoom talks with them called uh, First Impressions, um, where it's kind of, it's a combination of interview and reading uh, because I ask them questions um, and they also ask me questions and we both uh, read our poems. And in that way, we get to uh, know each other and become friends uh, through literature. 
Um, and I've done three of them so far. Um, and they've all been uh, different. We've had different topics, uh, topics of conversation. Um, and it, it's all been very natural uh, and organic. Um, and one other thing that I've done fairly recently is I, I started um, a writing group with um, about a dozen other uh, young local art, uh, writers um, from all genres. And uh, hopefully um, we can produce um, a collection of written works uh, to kind of mark um, Windsor's current youth um, literary scene. Good. Good. I just uh, follow up question. Um, when did uh, when did you first start writing, or when did you know that uh, that this was a, a gift of yours? I started writing about grade ten. Um, before that, I really didn't like poetry, and I blame it on the Romanian education system, um, who uh, made me hate it um, and not understand what it was or what it was meant for. But in grade 10 for one of my English assignments, um, we had to pick any poem we wanted, uh, memorize it and recite it. Um, and, you know, I was a bit reluctant, but I went on the internet and I found a list of poems alphabetically and I picked one of the first ones. And it was A Psalm of Life by um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And that poem kind of changed my life. It was the first poem that I fell in love with and um, made me realize what poetry can do. And then I started uh, writing soon after and I mainly did kind of similar to a spoken word. Um, and most of my topics were about uh, social justice and uh, progressive change. And as I started going to university and um, got subjected to more uh, poetry from all sorts of periods, I kind of changed my style to um, to more imagist poetry. Um, but I, I never really considered it, I, I don't know, a talent or anything. Um, I was just doing it because I felt the need to write and I would share my writing with friends. Um, I am, I was, I'm not in the creative writing program. So just friends from my literature courses, my philosophy courses and even other um, programs, I even introduce myself to many people with poems. I just give them a poem or tell them a poem I wrote. Um, so uh, yeah, it's been a surprise and um, I'm excited to see where, where it will take me um, because I have no idea. <laughs> well, as I, as I mentioned uh, a, f a few minutes ago, you know, I saw you at an uh, open air, a little a coffee shop uh, in, in the, the alley next to the coffee shop at Cafe Amor in, in Windsor. And uh, you were standing up there with a microphone and, and cafe tables all around you. And you were, uh, you know, people were, were coming by and standing and listening. Some of them coming and sitting and having coffee and, and uh, you know, what a great performance. It was so nice to be able to find you there in the middle of this pandemic and, and this uh, small place on Ottawa Street in, uh, in uh, Windsor, Ontario. It was great. It was good yeah. to hear you. Thanks so much thank for you. tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and actually just on one note, um, at the end of my set, uh, a group of teenagers uh, sat down at a table after I finished. And on my way out of the alleyway, I just left all my poems with them so they can check them out um, for themselves. Okay. Well, there's a great example for being the youth poet laureate. So good for you. Our next, our next reader is Albert Dumont, and he's a poet, a storyteller, a speaker, uh, and an Algonquin traditional teacher who's born in traditional Algonquin territory. He's published five books of poetry and short stories and two children's books written in three languages. Most recently, he published uh, Grandpa's Wisdom, an Algonquin reflection uh, on West Nile virus and Lyme disease. Uh, in Ottawa, this was an Ottawa public health initiative and it was written in English, French and Algonquin. Albert uh, Dumont has dedicated his life to preserving indigenous spirituality and rights and it hasn't uh, gone unnoticed. Upon reviewing uh, his book, Sitting by the Rapids, Maria Campbell said, these gentle words of love and powerful energy are like Albert himself. They encourage and guide the way 
for all those who read them. And Albert is regarded as a beacon of light for all, especially children. And in recognition of his volunteer work for ancestral lands, he was given the Human Rights Award by the Public Service Alliance of Canada in 2010. I'm so pleased to welcome, welcome Albert Dumont. So miigwech, Marty, for that. It's a really a nice intro. And uh, quite everybody on the call, uh, really uh, good to see you. And uh, welcome all the people who are listening from wherever they are in Ontario or Canada. I'm going just to, to read this first poem. It has to do with the environment. Place the wind you so trust into the mouths of men of dust. Let them speak for the land, the truthful words of men of sand. Heal our mother, they will say. Hear the prayer of men of clay. Defend the land, your place of birth, hand in hand with men of earth. Save our waters and all which need it. Hear the prayer of men of spirit. We will sacrifice if we must with the wind and men of dust. We, we live in a world where, um, where there's uh, oppression that occurs. And uh, sometimes after oppression has occurred, some people will say that they're sorry. So these, this poem has to do with that and it's, one, one side of it is uh, because of you. You pushed me into raging waters and I wonder if I will ever be the same. Because of you, I, I have forgotten the reasons for the blossoms and the purpose of the rain. Because of you, instead of smiling into the dawn, I hide and shed tear after tear. Because of you, I feel as the rust that descends onto the beauty of the autumn's maple leaves. Because of you, peace eludes me and I know only heartache everywhere I turn. It is good that you tell me that you are sorry, but, what, but tell me also what you will do that will restore who and what I was before your cruelty pushed me into raging waters. And the other side of it is, um, I pushed you into raging waters. And now I wonder if you will ever be the same. Because of me, you have forgotten the reasons for the blossoms and the purpose of the rain. Because of me, instead of smiling into the dawn, you hide and shed tear after tear. Because of me, you feel as the rust that descends onto the beauty of the autumn's maple leaves. Because of me, peace eludes you and you know only heartache everywhere you turn. I regret that I have caused you such great suffering and I am sorry. What would you have me do that would help you restore who and what you were before my cruelty pushed you into raging waters. And then just a short poem that I just wrote a couple of days ago. After my physical touch is gone forever from this earth, the trees will welcome me with song into my new spiritual home. I prepare today for that time when I die, I ask with profound humility that it is the trees whose voices will come forward to speak on my behalf and say, welcome South Wind to our spiritual land for you who are a good human being. That's it. That last poem, uh, it, uh, I spent the day, for example, walking in uh, in the woodland uh, near Windsor called Ojibwe Park. 
And uh, so when you see the trees will welcome me with song and, and whenever I walk there and I look at these trees are bending with the wind and, and some of them are gnarled and have crazy shapes to them, but they all look like they're dancing. And um, that last poem particularly means a lot to me. Thank you so much. I, I wanna ask you um, from what I've read about you, you are actually lucky to be alive today. Uh, tell us about that near tragic fall at a construction site that nearly took your life and how that really turned your life around and, and maybe helped you become a writer. Yeah, I was working as a stonemason and I was uh, 43 feet off the ground doing a, a chimney repair on, on a 130 year old building that uh, we had just finished doing the, the repair. And we were dismantling the scaffolding and I was right up at the top. Whenever the uh, tower section of scaffolding collapsed and I was right, you know, I was right up the top. So everything went down and so did I. And <laughs> I didn't think I had any uh, chance of living, but I wasn't afraid. I just said to myself, end of the line. And then it was like, I heard a voice that said, land on your feet and you will not die. And I managed to land on my feet. Um, a witness wow. came to see me at the hospital and he said it looked like I was trying to fly. But that was because my arms were moving so much that I would land on my feet. But I crushed two vertebrae in my back and I cracked two vertebrae in my back. I cracked my spine above and below the damaged vertebrae. For almost two years, I had uh, about a pound, well, over a pound of stainless steel nuts and bolts holding my spine together. I had, a, I had to wear a body brace for 18 months. So I, I live with chronic pain and I don't uh, take any, uh, anything for it. Uh, you know, physical, physical pain is what it is. And, uh, and uh, it could be worse for me. You know, I could be dead or, or I could be paralyzed. So I consider myself lucky that I'm just in physical pain. And I know that the, I know I'd rather have a sore back than a broken heart, if you know what I mean. So, um, you know, emotional pain is worse than uh, physical pain. Yeah. And uh, so after my accident there, and uh, I, had, I was just three years into my sobriety, I had severe addiction issues. And uh, so it's 33 years that I have uh, been sober and I want to give my life purpose. I was tired of wasting my life. You know, I want to know the difference between common sense and nonsense. Uh, so uh, two years later, after my accident, I wanted to uh, acknowledge those five years of sobriety. And I was very poor at the time. And uh, I have uh, children, I have daughters, I, I don't have any sons. And I wanted to uh, celebrate that five years of sobriety somehow, because I couldn't afford to take my family out for supper. So what I did was write a poem. And uh, that was my first poem. Uh, and uh, somehow it ended up at, with a newspaper editor and she called me and said that I should copyright that poem and write more poetry. So I've written hundreds of poems since then. And, and I, 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 don't, I don't think I want to live to be a hundred years old because I, I suffer every day. But if I did live to be a hundred, um, I want to write poetry to <laughs> my last day of my life. Well, it looks like um, the medicine that you don't want to take, but the medicine you do take, you, you wrote somewhere that, that you believe that poetry was the medicine that it you need. Poetry is the healer. It is, yeah, for a fact. Yeah. For me, anyway. And uh, uh, that was wonderful. I mean, you, you, the other thing you said about poetry was that it's made you a better human being. Mm -hmm. if, That's right. I think uh, well, I'm a human rights activist and, and wherever there's human rights violations occurring on this planet, whoever's being oppressed could count on me to at least put some tobacco down here and, and pray to offer a prayer that the oppression will stop in where, wherever they are. So uh, I, um, I, I write a lot of poetry about uh, justice. I write a lot of poetry about uh, about people who are recovering from past trauma or unresolved grief and 
and I, li I like to write poetry about veterans. So I definitely, whenever you, you've, you've got your mind frame fixed on those topics, that you're definitely going to become a, a better human being because these are all things of humanity. Well, Ottawa is uh, fortunate in having you as its poet laureate. And uh, thank you for being here tonight. And, uh, our next reader is Victoria Butler, and she is uh, an advocate for the creative rights. Uh, she's uh, Barry's first poet, first female poet laureate, and certainly a miracle worker in her own hometown. Moving away for a university was a cultural shock uh, for Victoria, she says, and she went to the University uh, of, of Toronto, and there were many platforms for creative individuals to share their work. But when she returned to Barrie, she felt that there was a considerable lack of publishing opportunities for the creative arts. But that inspired her to create something to co-found the Northern Appeal, a literary journal whose sole purpose is to get people published in Simcoe County and Muskoka. Filled with stories, poems, photographs, sketches, and so much more, the, this journal publishes twice a year. It gives local creatives ample time to apply. It's a not-for-profit as any income is generated back into the journal. Uh, it is a blessing for those without the means to showcase their work on their own. Uh, Little Miracles is, um, is, her, is uh, Victoria's first book of poetry. And uh, she celebrated its release just a few weeks ago, I think, in a socially distanced manner, you know, sitting on blankets laid out on the grass with bright lights all around. And the book is her own little miracle. And after all, she has given to her community a deserving one. It's great to have you back at Poetry at the Manor. Welcome, Victoria. Thank you so much, Marty. It's so nice to be back. Um, the first poetry at the manor I went to was so much fun. I felt like a celebrity and I got like driven around places and I got to read my poetry and it was a really, so I'm just so happy to be able to be back here. Um, I feel super starstruck right now also just listening to everyone's stories and like being on the same platform with all of you. Louise, I was actually um, assigned your poetry to read in one of my classes the other day. So <laughs> I like, when you started reading, I just text, I checked my textbook to make sure it was actually you. And I was like, oh my God, I'm totally sending this to my professor. So I get extra credit or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, my first book of poetry just came out. Um, it's called Little Miracles, published through the one and only Black Moss Press. At Black Moss Press. Um, I'm really thrilled that you guys took a chance on my manuscript and saw potential in it. And uh, yeah, so I will stop blabbing now and I will read some poems. Um, so the first one I'm going to read is called Burning Bay Leaves. Everything feels like love to me, even the way you stand waiting for me even the way you give up on holding my hand. I only know the word as a push and pull, as something that breaks me down only to pull me back up, weak and desperate to hear you say something that I can dream about later. After you've gone and left me to imagine what love could look like, to imagine that you are still awake because of me, that you want this, but you are afraid like the rest of us. There's always a lightness in my chest when I dream about you, no matter how thick you've built this wall. Maybe it is hope, maybe it is delusion. Regardless, you are across town dreaming of someone with darker hair. So that is my first one. Um, the second one I'm gonna read is called Newfoundland One. Um, my dad's side of the family is from Newfoundland and years ago I took a trip there on my own and met a bunch of family members that I would literally never met before. Um, and if you know anything about Newfies, they're quite fun. So <laughs> uh, it was a really great visit, but at the time I was really struggling with um, a lot of mental health issues. And I thought that I could just like buy a plane ticket and run away and all my problems would be gone. And it turns out you actually can't do that. Um, so this is <laughs> this is what uh, 
that poem is about. Half of my history rests in the rocks and the rum. I keep telling myself the ocean air will fix this, that I'll be clean again when I can see the waves. I am grateful for Folsom Prison Blues and the way the old ladies talk and talk, but I don't think I stepped foot in St. John's. If I did, I can't remember. So that was my second one. I'm going to read this cute poem that I wrote about my mom. It's called Mother. It's made a lot of moms cry. That's the biggest feedback I've gotten on my book. Like, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> it's that everyone cries about the mom poem. So it's called Mother. My, my mother brings me strawberries from her garden before noon. Asks how I would like my coffee every time I visit because she knows some days call for cream and cinnamon while others are more comfortable with bitterness. Her hands have a tendency to fold warm laundry even when I tell her to leave it to someone else with more time. Those hands are much softer than mine, her skin preserved with frankincense and coconut oil. She never lets me leave the house without a hug. In her arms is when I know for certain we are a part of each other, deeper than biology. Something ancient in us that beats under our breastbone and pours out our fingertips. She tells me that it is confusing being the way that we are. To love deeply is to be lonely, misunderstood, to ache, to feel it all like a storm you have no choice but to walk through. But home is at the end of the road. And where else would you go? Who else is there to be? There are old histories she keeps pressed to her chest, folded neat and tidy like those clothes she stacks in my basket and leaves at the end of my bed. Dates attached to memories arrive silently, like a weekday in early summer. Her old pain doesn't flicker in her eyes or creep across her mouth. Instead, she fills the house with extra kindnesses, cleans up the rooms that have been left a mess, pulls pests off of her plants, throws blueberries into dough for us to eat in the morning. Here I am stuck wondering why she keeps this routine, not yet understanding that being a mother means a specific means a type of sacrifice that is never acknowledged as such. Sacrifice is too negative a word. To be her is to love, and the way you don't question breath, you simply do it. And then I'm just gonna read one more. Um, it is called Tacky. And fun fact about this poem, my editor never actually saw this. I snuck this in after he gave me the final manuscript. So sorry to Bruce Meyer, but I really wanted this one in there. <laughs> Tacky. Our recycled arguments filter through the curtains when I am up too early. My front door opens up to a beacon of what used to save me. Drunk and lost, wandering to the ancient burial grounds our city tried to forget about as if the dead have vanished. Every dream of you feels like a mistake I keep making. The tears come in bursts when I'm not looking. And you, dearest, collect more ink and never admit to anything. <laughs> I don't ever know what to do at the end of readings. I just kind of do jazz hands and <laughs> thank you so much though. Well, thank you, Victoria. I. Um... I have a question for you. Uh, when you read the poem about your mom, and you know, you you paint a wonderful picture. You paint, you know, like you know, putting the blueberries out for you. You know, st stacking something on your bed in your room. Um, I'm just wondering, like, so in all the things that she's doing for you, do you see your mom as an influence on your writing? Um. It's interesting because my parents are both very artistic, but they neither of them really understand poetry. And mm -hmm. that's not something that's not me being like mean behind their back. Like that's something they've spoken to me about where they just, it doesn't connect with them. Like it connects with me. Um, but because of the way that my family sort of operates and what I've learned from my mother, especially in what I do talk about in that poem about how difficult it is to be 
a very like empathetic loving person and that's something I've, I learned from her and most of my writing is about dealing with the pain or the joy that comes along with feeling those really deep difficult emotions so I guess I've never really thought about it in that way before but she definitely would be just in the way that I was raised in the way that like I am 100% her daughter um, in the way that like we understand things like that the other people in my family don't like my brother and my my dad will sometimes just be like get over it it's fine and it's like me and my mom are like no this hurts me and this is why this is hurting me and this is the world is hurting and we kind of feel it all so but she has different outlets for that than I do whereas I put it into writing and she has a really nice garden so <laughs> but yeah I okay. guess the, the the I would say yes she is definitely a really big influence on my writing whether yeah. she knows <laughs> I, I got that I got that impression just from the in a very subtle uh, influential way. Um, another question I have for you um, is every poet laureate has a story to tell from their community and and I know that um, it's one of the things that Rundell is, is working on you know in getting poets laureate from across Ontario to tell their stories. In Windsor I mean we see the river as a focal point and there is a multitude of stories surrounding it. Uh, what about Barry? You know, what is the story there for you as a, as a poet laureate? Um, what city council would really like me to say is Kempenfelt Bay is the grounding <laughs> part of Barry. Mm -hmm. um, I sure the bay is great, but um, I truly think that the grounding story for Barry is change, and Barry seems to be going through a lot of it in the last couple of years. Um, for the longest time, I think that things have been a certain way here, um, especially in their politics. Um, Barry always goes blue, no matter what. Um, city council is mostly comprised of um, people with similar politics and it, it feels really hard to get people to care a lot of the time, like care about art, care about social issues, care about any of the issues that we have here. We have a rampant opioid crisis. We have um, a we have a really um, high homeless population. We have a lot of these things that I think Barry would like very much to be swept under the rug. And they're trying very hard to do that through, you know, just thinking you can build a condo and then everyone who's experiencing ho homelessness will just disappear. <laughs> um, and there, in the last few years, since I've become Poet Laureate, there's been sort of this uprising of people with similar, like, like-minded individuals realizing, like, there's a lot of beauty here, and there's an amazing community, and there are people here, unlike anyone, anywhere I've ever met before, that just care. They care about things um, in ways that I didn't really see when I lived in Toronto and don't really see in other communities as much. And um, that is sort of becoming the, f we're stirring up a lot of trouble and ruffling quite a few feathers. A lot of the people that are trying to push for this change and it's making a lot of people very unhappy. And yeah. I think that's really great. Like I kind of love it, honestly. Like it, every, every day is sort of like, sometimes it feels very exhausting and it's, I go to bed feeling like, why am I still here? And why don't I move away where things are just a little bit easier? And I can find like, everyone is sort of in a similar boat politically and socially, but I know I'm not gonna do that mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, this is my community and it means so much to me. And that change, that fact that we know what the potential is here and we want to uncover that mm -hmm. and we're gonna fight until we do. Sure. So I think that would be, that's sort of, in my opinion, what is kind of grounding the city together, but don't tell anyone on city council that gives me money that because they'll get mad at me. <laughs> well, you know, you're making a difference and that's that's the important thing. I think, uh, you know, as, as a poet laureate, you know, you're a voice for your community and you're telling the truth and you're gonna make a difference. So um, hopefully uh, they will hear this <laughs> and, and watch this. Um, Thank you so much, Victoria.
So I'll finish uh, with a poem. Uh, it's called Blue Sky Snapshots. And uh, uh, earlier, um, um, Albert, uh, you were talking about trees and I go for, I go for long walks all the time uh, in the woods. And, um, and I take photographs when I'm there and I'm particularly intrigued by the, you know, by the, by the trees. Um, but I also dream photographs. And this is about dreaming photographs. Blue sky snapshots. This recurring dream of a boy riding a bicycle along a narrow ridge that juts out into the sea and I watch him race along this windy precipice, my camera trained on this reckless spectacle and see him run right off the edge, arms and legs and hands holding on to nothing but the blue sky as the bicycle tumbles below him and nothing. I miss the shot, so caught up in the moment I failed to press the shutter and nothing. I see the boy riding a bicycle along a narrow strip of high grass, slowing as he nears the cliff edge, peering at the crashing waves in a day so blue. And somehow when he looks up, I notice his eyes like the sea below. And I wonder why he lingers. And finally I spot him, see him back up to start again, the bicycle obscured by the tall grass, but he moves with steady pace, shoulders and head bowed intently. And the bicycle soars off the edge and I watch how he grips the handlebars to plummet into the sea. And again, I fumble and nothing, too late with my camera that sits like a stone in the palm of my hand. I dream again and watch the boy study the windy path that brings him back and feel the tires lift from shifting soil in that solitary place above the sea where billowy clouds have gathered nearby like fans in the bleachers. And the boy sits straight up as he sails over the edge, floating in slowest of motion above the sea. And I look closely in his hands, suddenly free of the handlebars and purpose is my camera. And now I am the one in focus in all that is blue. And so with that, uh, um, I'm gonna ask uh, Marianne Mulhern uh, to come back to, to say a few words. Uh, Marianne. Thanks, Marty. I want to thank Marty Gervais, talented, gifted laureate, writer and publisher. Marty was inspired to begin poet, uh, poetry at the Manor several years ago. And we wait for this every year. Windsor waits for this because it's just wonderful. Also many thanks to Christopher Menard, Joanne Geniak, Michelle Stadgard, manager of cultural affairs Windsor. We'll finish this remarkable evening with music from the talented Chrissy Cochran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, and again, what a wonderful, magical evening and sharing of all of these poems. And my gratitude to each one of you for being a, a part of this perfect and brilliant celebration of poems and stories. And if you would please, uh, you know, in, 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 in finishing this, just so uh, wave goodbye, bid adieu to everyone watching and thank you again, so. Good evening. I'm Michelle Stoudegard, Manager of Culture and Events at the City of Windsor. On behalf of the City and the Community Services Division, I wanna thank Marty, Marianne, Alexi, Louise, Albert, Randell, Victoria, Nadine, and Chrissy for sharing their words, music, and talent with us tonight. And to thank you all for tuning in for Poetry at the Manor, Volume 9. This was our second virtual edition, and we're proud to see this event proceed safely this year as we continue navigating the pandemic. Walking into Williston Manor and seeing our heritage gem bursting with people eager to hear poetry is a truly magical experience, and we look forward to returning to the in-person celebration in the near future.
This year, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of our Poet Laureate program. We're also celebrating the ninth anniversary of our trend-setting poetry at the Manor event. Over the last 10 years, we've had four poets take up positions in our program. We've grown from one Poet Laureate to three. We've welcomed 36 Poets Laureate from across Canada to come to Windsor and share their words, their poetry with our community. We've used poetry to celebrate the opening of new community spaces and to reflect on devastating losses around the world. During the pandemic, we put poems on buses and on the walls of hospitals and mass vaccination clinics. We published poetry collections. We've shown what's possible through the absolute connecting power of poetry. And now we are growing our program to find new and meaningful ways to capture, preserve, and share the stories that build our community up and that shape our identities. We look forward to this exciting evolution of this program that will soon take shape. Thanks again to our guest poets who shared with us this year and to all of you in the audience who join us on this journey. Please keep watching to enjoy the animated music video, Why, from Chrissy Cochran, a local musician who has received support through the Arts, Culture and Heritage Fund, another of the programs we love in Windsor. Good night, everyone, and thanks again. Why did you have to come at the wrong time in the starlight? There were tears in my eyes. Summer on the mountain, my heart in the ground. You and the shovel and the dirt.